Hey everybody, welcome to Speculative Work. I'm James Aaron, and this is my author diary and sometimes interview show on being a science fiction author. This is episode 16. I'm recording on April 18th, 2019, and it uh, looks like 10.30 p.m. So the baby has been asleep for three hours, and so far I think I'm, I'm good. I can sneak away for an hour and actually get away with recording a podcast. Um, basically everything in my life currently has become baby willing um, when it comes to uh, getting things done. So um, I'm, uh, I'm rolling with the punches. So uh, I'm coming off a good week of editing my novel and I'll talk about that a bit during the updates. Um, but the thing that I would, I thought that I would talk about during this episode is the idea of abundance mentality as a writer. And I've had some great inspiration this past week from different folks that I think are really um, providing great examples of that to writers. And so you can kind of look at how they're directing their careers right now if you want to see how folks are both having an abundance mentality, but also using that to further their marketing goals, create connections, um, build relationships, that sort of thing. So if you've never heard of this concept before, basically what it means is that you personally are the goose that lays golden eggs. So um, you always have the ability to create content. You just have to give yourself permission to do it. But also how that concept can change as you start to make money and expectations grow around your writing career. So that's kind of what I wanted to touch on. But I've got a few other things that I think flow into that idea as well in the updates. So this last week, um, I'm doing a lot of editing. So I, I printed out my book and I've been going through the print copy, which is not something that I've done in a while, um, but I've been chipping away at this. Made some really good progress at a co-working space that is run by a local nonprofit. And that is definitely something that I'm going to do again. So one thing I've kind of realized um, with the baby is that I can't, it's very difficult to get work done at home and it's impossible to do any writing work when I'm at work. So having a third place that I can go that isn't, you know, a bar full of distractions or, you know, another place that just, it's hard, it's hard to go places and, and write, I think, or to focus on editing if you're surrounded by noise and people. And I even have a hard time focusing in Starbucks sometimes just because there's too much stuff going on. So it was really nice to be able to uh, just sit someplace for a couple hours that was away from work where I just had a table and I could put on noise canceling headphones and knock out some editing. So it's going to be uh, probably something that I will definitely pay for <laughs> going forward. And it's not, it's not super expensive, so I'm excited about it. Um, Reading-wise, so because my book takes place on uh, a future moon, you know, Luna, our moon, I, there are a couple things that I've really wanted to make sure I'm getting right or that I'm meeting reader expectations around, you know, what people already think of when they think of science fiction on the moon. And... The, the biggest book I, I kept coming back to is just Moon is a Harsh Mist Mistress by Robert Heinlein. And I had never read it before. And so I really wanted to see how he set up his world building for describing what it was like on the moon. And what I kind of discovered is that he doesn't much go into it at all. So <laughs> things that I was concerned about is like how people would basically just operate and live their lives and reduce gravity. Uh, what they think of living underground, you know, building underground. And also the dust, because moon dust is incredibly harsh, and that's one of the obstacles to a colony on the moon. Um, he get, I mean, he spends a lot of time getting into sort of uh, economics of a colony and, and things like that. And, and the time I'm writing in would sort of be past all that, where there's a sustainable colony on the moon. In fact, you know, millions of people live there. There's a ring around the Earth, so. The moon is just a, uh, actually I kind of write it as a, a leisure destination to get away from the uh, the ring because it's sort of a, a Las Vegas um, during that time period. So that was uh, actually kind of took some weight off my shoulders because <laughs> I didn't think people, I don't, I'm not sure what expectations people will be bringing to my book. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time or really over um, weight the uh, 
the story with the world building. So I, I think I have enough touches in there to kind of keep reminding people about things being being different on Luna. So, but anyway, it's um, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress is uh, it's a good. I mean, it moves fast. It really dumps you right into the story, and I think it's got a. He was definitely exploring political themes, and and this is a book that a lot of libertarians use as an example in science fiction. Uh, I found myself kind of more tied up or thinking about like how Heinlein is introducing characters, how he's um, kind of setting up the like as the as the plot propels itself forward, the different incidents that bring that about um, were pretty interesting to me. Um, some of the descriptions are pretty clunky, you know, and definitely taught you know are are a remnant of their time. Um, especially the interactions between men and women and, and whatnot, but it's still, it's an entertaining book and, uh, it's widely available on YouTube. If you want to listen to the, um, the, uh, audio book, <laughs> but one thing I thought was really interesting. So I was looking, you know, just looking at reviews on Amazon. And one of the things about Moon is a Harsh Mistress is that, um, it's at least the portion I've read so far, which is a little more than half, um, is all in a very, uh, like, a very particular kind of voice that is kind of a pigeon Russian, uh, imagine that in the future. And I really like the way that Heinlein doesn't, I mean, he, he definitely describes why the character talks that way, but you, I think listening to it made it a lot easier to absorb than if I had been reading it, where it'd take a second to kind of pick that up because the narrator just went right into the Russian accent. And so you picked it up right off, but the number of uh, people that it wasn't a lot, but some people just, could not stand that voice or couldn't stand the way it was written, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, you know, that even a writer that people think of as being like pulpish or straight up, you know, adventure type like Heinlein was trying to do interesting and inventive things with the voice in his, in the book. And so I found that really, really interesting. Um, let's see. So other things that happened this week, uh, that this one really bummed me out. So, Gene Wolfe passed, uh, and if you have not read Gene Wolfe, he is my favorite science fiction fantasy writer, and I think he's he's a writer that any writer can emulate, and his work, uh, it really rewards multiple readings, and I don't read a lot of books twice, I just don't have time, but G Gene Wolfe is probably the only writer that I have, I have read his books multiple times, and my favorite books by him are some of his more oddball ones like Castle View or There Are Doors. Um, but Book of Book of the New Sun, which is a, a five book series, is probably my favorite. And I first read that back when I was in high school and then kind of got it as like a far future adventure story. And then I, I fully remember like really thinking it was interesting how the characters lived in these metal towers with metal floors and the way everything was, was described. And then it wasn't until I want to say I was like in my early 20s and I was reading an article about the book of the new sun and they talked about the towers being rockets and all of a sudden like it clicked in my mind that I had not picked up on the fact that the towers were rockets and all of a sudden like I, I picked it up and started reading it again almost immediately and all of this description and world building that Wolf was doing so subtly became just really apparent like all the things that he was he was showing um you know, without outright telling. And that's one thing about that book is there's, there's so many layers and there's a lot of really crazy interpretations of the book of the new sun with a lot of interesting stuff. That's one of those books that, you know, kind of provides a lot of material to inter interpret it in different ways that you will. But I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a, one of the first times, like I was, I was that sad when Ursula Gwynn passed because um, she was a big influence on my life. I was really sad when Kate Wilhelm passed because I actually got to work with her and she gave me feedback on my work and that was just, that sucked. And then now Gene Wolfe is one of the, you know, it feels like there's this generation of writers that I read that first really drew me into science fiction and fantasy when I was a teenager that we're losing now. And I don't really attend cons. I haven't had an ability to meet or interact with some of these folks. And I, Gene Wolfe is one that I just I just really wish I could have met him and, and told him how much I enjoyed his work and how, as a science fiction writer, I mean, he, his work is just so, so layered, so, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to call any work perfect, but, but his work is, is as close to perfect as it gets, I think, 
but he also produced a body of work while he was still working full time. And I mean, he, he had retired since, I think he retired like in the, I don't know, late nineties or something, but for a good portion of his career, when he was producing Hugo and Nebula winning work, he was also working full time, like editing a, um, I want to say it was a chemicals industry uh, magazine. And so that meant the world to me. Like here's somebody who is doing all the regular things you need to do in life and still able to be a science fiction writer. And that's obviously has been a big goal for me um, to try and find a way to, you know, work my way into writing full time. But like a lot of people, I've also got all the requirements of life, you know, need health insurance, got a family, need to make at least a certain amount of money to pay the mortgage and et cetera, et cetera. And so seeing writers that are able to do that. Um, and, and here's the thing, like he did, I, I wonder like a writer like Gene Wolfe, like I certainly hope he would have made enough money from his his writing that he could have maybe left his, his job if he wanted to, but um, maybe that wasn't the case, you know? So, but still that he produced that work while he was also working 40 hours a week is just uh, hugely inspiring to me. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really sad that he's, he's gone. Um, the other kind of interesting news is, which ties into the abundance mentality that I want to talk about is the fact that Apex Magazine announced that they're going on hiatus, indefinite hiatus. And I had not submitted to Apex in quite a while, but a good friend of mine who is still actively submitting to magazines got an email that, uh, you know, they, they got an indefinite hiatus and they were releasing all stories in their queue. And so if you hadn't read Apex, it's uh, just a, a Hugo winning uh, short fiction magazine. And they also would publish their short stories as audio, which was cool for me because I like to, you know, if I'm busy doing something else, I could listen to the short, a short story in audio and keep up with what's out there as far as kind of the traditional pipeline for, um, for new short stories and new, new short fiction. So, so that's a bummer, you know, and I, when I think about just, you can kind of do the math on, if, if your average author is getting paid six cents a word and how much it costs to publish a, you know, 6,000 word story, um, you know, and then paying artists and layout design and, uh, and then also if you're editing it or you have an editorial team, like paying yourself a reasonable salary to make it, uh, you know, a reasonable endeavor and then to have health insurance on top of that, which for any entrepreneur is going to cost, you know, anywhere from, you know, 300 a month for a catastrophic plan up to like 1200 for a family. Um, there's some real costs there. And so I think if you're, it's very difficult to have a, an endeavor like that now and have it be sustainable if it's your full-time, full-time job. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised, but it's also kind of sad, but one of the things, the juxtaposition here that makes me think of is like the recent kind of kerfuffle with the nebula where, a number of independent authors were nominated for the Nebula, and one of the complaints that was kind of levied against those writers was that they came out of nowhere, you know, where they were sort of nominated by this group that wasn't part of the, the mainstream of the way short fiction is typically nominated, where, you know, people would read it in magazines like Apex, like Analog, like uh, Asimov's, um, Clark's World, that kind of thing. So a lot of people that are in that pipeline read that work and then they're the ones that vote on it. Well, as we're seeing, we've got this second pipeline that is coming up through, you know, independent publishing, uh, which is primarily on Amazon and Kindle Unlimited or, you know, those, a few other self-publishing markets out there where anybody can publish to that market. But unless they're doing a certain amount of, or type of marketing, they're not hitting that channel that is Asimov's Apex Clark's word, w world, where, a certain kind of reader is built into that pipeline. Well, um, so there's a divergence here, but something I've seen recently, which is what got me thinking about abundance mentality is the fact that we're seeing, I think we're seeing a lot of anthologies popping up specifically in Kindle Unlimited, um, where, you know, the whole idea is that uh, a writer or, or an editor will organize this anthology. It's in Kindle Unlimited for, you know, maybe a period of a year, the, all the writers that are part of it, like they split royalties, 
if you make money, awesome. Honestly, they don't often make a lot of money because if you're going to split it between, you know, even 10 to 15 people, like that's really splitting up the royalties quite a bit. But, but I've made, you know, I've made pretty good money off anthologies. I think the most I've made was like 1500 bucks, um, which is better than I would have got if I'd sold it to, um, to a magazine. <laughs> but, uh, but these are popping up and then, so they'll be on, on Kindle Unlimited for a limited amount of time, you know, typically a year at the most. And then the rights revert back to the authors, which is what would happen with a magazine, but it's also just very different in the way that uh, they're marketed and the way the number of people that might actually read it or see it. And then the stories could, are then released or, um, you know, where the author can then use them for other, other marketing. Whereas I think some of the stories that often would appear in print magazines or their, you know, their digital equivalents in that, in that other channel were not typically like that. Like once the story um, was in the magazine, unless it was resold to another anthology or, or resold, you know, at some point, um, that's kind of it for that story, depending on, depending on the writer. You know, some writers sell their stories over and over again. So, but I think as, as these new anthologies, like I kind of look at them as, as magazines, you know, and they're, they're often anchored by one or two or three uh, more popular writers that or writers that just have larger audiences. And so it's an opportunity for folks to get, you know, to look at other writers that they might not have seen before. And so they're basically doing the work of these magazines that have been out there. So I think we're going to see more, more action with that. And so it's going to be a matter of like, how do we get those anthologies slash magazines into that channel or in front of the people that were, were reading the print magazines so that they start treating that work the same, the same way, you know, giving it the same attention so that the next time the nebulas roll around, like it's not, it's not this crazy thing that writers that are in this other channel have are nominated for awards. Um, so that's, that's something I think we're potentially going to see more of because, you know, it's, it's the deal with any, you know, some Asimov's has been around for, you know, decades at this point, other, other magazines that might be a little more tenuous, um, you know, we could see them, they go on hi hiatus. I want to say, uh, was it Shimmer or Uncanny? Like an, another one just recently went on hiatus too. That was a really nice, large format, um, print magazine. So, so we'll continue to see upheaval. I think that uh, as readers are pulled into the Amazon ecosystem or more pulled into, um, you know, reading on e-readers, like one of the things that's a little frustrating with print magazines is that the way the subscription works, depending on how you do it, like you can't hang on to the copies on your e-reader, which I think is another thing that kind of encourages people to grab an anthology because... Uh, if it's in Kindle Unlimited, you can kind of, you can check it out, read it, and then if let it go. And if you want to pull it back, you can, you know, check it out again if you want to. I've got a subscription to a bunch of magazines. One of them, a uh, magazine of fantasy and science fiction, I actually get in print because the way the Kindle subscription works is uh, if you have a subscription, every time you get a new issue, it erases the old one. <laughs> um, as far as I understand, I haven't quite figured out how to make it not do that. Um... And so that's always kind of frustrating because I like to hang on to the magazines if I can. You know, I want to go back and look at a story if it's something that I thought was doing something interesting. So, so it kind of feels like in some ways some of these print magazines haven't quite bridged the gap into the new digital marketplace. Also, one of my frustrations, if I buy the print version of a magazine, I would love to have the, the digital version as well. And why do I have to buy two subscriptions if I want that? And so that's, that's been kind of irritating. So, um, oh, you know what? I think it was uh, Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Roadshow. I think that one folded recently as well. So th there may be more. I should do research on this, but <laughs> I think there's been more closures of short fiction markets than I'm thinking. I was thinking about initially. So that's just going to drive even more, even more writers into this this new ecosystem. So before I jump to abundance mentality, the one thing I did want to note that I thought was awesome this last week and you should check out is Tim Ferriss did a long interview with Neil Gaiman, which is, it was great. Um, if you're not, if you don't listen to, to Tim Ferriss, he's one of these sort of intentional living, um, 
kind of life hacker type folks. He wrote the Four Hour Work Week and Four Hour Body and whatnot, Tools of Titans. His interviews are usually long, from like an hour and a half to two hours. So actually, his interview with Neil Gaiman is relatively short, compar- you know, comparatively. But it's just a great interview, and I, Neil Gaiman is, he just talks about his career. He's they spend a lot of time talking about Terry Pratchett and his relationship with Terry Pratchett and the two of them working together and then also transitioning to uh, being a producer on Good Omens and how he felt about that project without Terry Pratchett being part of it. Uh, but uh, just really a great interview and I highly recommend it. I'll put, a, I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check that out. So, okay, abundance mentality. What, what does that mean? And one of the things I'm, I'm kind of like talking through this, explaining it uh, to myself and the way I feel about it, because I have the opportunity to take this podcast and repurpose it as a guest newsletter for an author that I greatly admire that he sent out in his latest newsletter, which I subscribe to a note at the bottom saying, if you have an idea for your own, uh, he like sends out short essays about writing and things like that. And if you have your, your own idea about um, something author, you know, people might find useful, hit reply and, you know, pitch me the idea. So there it was like an, an opportunity. And so I love to say yes, but I have to be more selective about how I do that. And that's something I kind of, I want to talk about. So what really got me thinking about abundance mentality was, uh, on the last AN14 podcast, we, uh, Michael Cooper is, you know, always on the AN14 podcast or most of them, but we had Andrew Dobell on and, they, the two of them recently collaborated on a book uh, called Anomaly at Circa, which was a crossover between two universes, Aeon 14 and um, Andrew DeBell's uh, Space Megai series, which is like, you know, sorcerers in space. This was kind of a risk, and they weren't quite sure what would happen when they did it. But Andrew was looking at different ways to promote his series. And so he basically approached a bunch of different writers to see if they wanted to do crossovers uh, with his main character. And so it was an opportunity, like he's trying something wildly different. And he has mostly written uh, kind of urban fantasy and now this space fantasy. And so in some ways it's an opportunity for him to... And he explained this, explains this in the podcast, so you should definitely go check it out. But it was an opportunity for him to push himself as a writer and then also work with other writers to, do, you know, to get that crossover. So, so here's something you know, kind of off the wall. He approaches Michael with the idea, and Michael says, sure, let's do it. And we're, it's still kind of you know, waiting to see like, how the audience embraces this. But having that mentality that to say to say yes that you're willing to try new things that you're willing to kind of open yourself to new projects is putting your faith in abundance and i first heard this term in dating <laughs> but strangely enough and what it meant in dating is like not being overly needy you know having self confidence uh if you went on your very first date and you immediately jump into like an emo- a relationship in your head about someone and you become really clingy and needy and, and don't want to let them go. That is not an abundance mentality. That's a scarcity mentality because you're afraid that if you let that thing go, you're going to lose everything. And in business, abundance mentality is what you see behind a lot of networking groups. Like, you know, here in the States, we have the, the 2030 Club or um, the, uh, I don't know, Rotarians or things like that, where it's kind of a passive networking tool that broadens personal influence and builds credibility by giving of yourself to other people to try new projects. Um, and I think the goal, the ultimate goal of abundance mentality of working with people and, you um, bringing new projects into your life is people become to know, like, and trust you, which in business or marketing or things like that, that's the gold standard. That's that's what you want. You want people to know, like, and trust you. And so as a writer, how can you do that? You know, um, 
But here's the thing. So as a writer, your priceless skill that makes you the goose that lays the golden eggs is that you can always make more stories. And you can always make more characters. You can always make something. If you practice scarcity as a writer, um, for me, that's where I'm, I'm chasing the muse. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for inspiration to come to me. If I was working on the same manuscript for way too long, because I think that's the, the only thing I'm going to produce, if I'm chasing perfection, um, those are all scarcity mentalities because I'm an author, I'm a person who tells stories, I want to be able to create as much as possible. So if an opportunity comes into my life, I want to, uh, I want to embrace that. And I think that for some folks, like they might not feel abundance yet. And in some ways, I think abundance is definitely a muscle you have to develop. For me, that comes through, you know, I've, I've fully learned it through like the importance of daily writing. You know, writing even 500 words a day shows you how much you can produce over time. You know, if you can do a thousand words a day, that's that's even more. So, so if I'm a writer that can produce 60,000 words in a month pretty comfortably, then it really doesn't cost me much to take on a project and, and write something in someone's someone else's world or um, as part of another project because if it doesn't go anywhere, I can still keep writing, right? I can still make, I can still make more. Um, basically, the way I even got the, uh, you know, being able to, to co-write with Michael Cooper was um, he had thrown out a newsletter swap. And at the time, newsletter swaps were not as popular as they are today. And so I, I hadn't read his work. I actually checked out his work to see if he would be a good fit and enjoyed his uh, first book, Out System. And so that led to, yeah, he offered doing the newsletter swap. I jumped in to figure out how I could do it. And then that led to a conversation about he was looking for co-writers. Um, and it, it kind of grew from there. So there are a lot of ways that these opportunities will come into your life, especially as a writer if you start networking with other writers because um, one of the things everybody needs is is more networking, more audience building, more ways to reach out to readers that you haven't had before. And while I think that readers are finite, I do think that certain readers um, never get enough, you know? And so, so among those readers, like, cross-promoting with another writer is definitely a, a great thing. It's going to help you. Um, in a lot of ways, the current market has incorporated a bit, a bit of a churn. You know, that's what a subscription service is really always going to lead towards more and more and more. And so if you have that abundance mentality that I can always create more stories, I can always create more characters, you know, knowing the fundamentals, once, once you know how to build the table, then you can build a bunch of different tables or experiment with different things because you know the bedrock of what makes that work. And then also, you know, once you understand how to make a certain kind of story, then you can branch out and experiment with other things like mystery or romance or historical or, you know, things of that nature so that you are more comfortable trying new things, but it also doesn't cost you that much when you, when you try. So one of my mentors is Nina Hoffman. And the thing that I have learned from experienced writers like Nina, and also another writer I've learned a lot from, Eric Witchy, is that stories are everywhere, and you can work that muscle as a writer to find stories or develop stories that might not even have even occurred to you. Um, so like Nina, for instance, has, uh, when she teaches classes, she likes to give out little uh, spiral-bound notebooks, and she calls those story catchers. And so the idea is that you keep that in your pocket and if something occurs to you throughout the day, you can write that down. Or if you see something interesting, you can write that down. And then Eric Witchy goes like one more step. So he'll have a story catcher and then he'll have, he'll actually break it into three columns. So it'll be like character, situation, problem. And he'll number those, you know, one, two, three. And then when he sits down, so he'll capture these ideas all the time as things are interesting and occur to him. And then when it's time to sit down to write, he'll roll a die and just match up three random, three of those random sections so that he has the character situation and problem. And then that is always the seed of a story for him. And so he likes to say that he could basically sit down and write a story at the drop of a hat because he has that, he has that there. He has that mentality that he can always create a story if necessary. Okay, it's one thing to have an, an abundance mentality 
around my work. Like, yeah, I want to be able to say yes to people. I want to be able to take on new and different projects, but how do I do that? <laughs> and for me, that gets down to the essentials. So when Eric is talking about, you know, character situation problem and having these three examples that he, or these three ideas that he's going to put together, he automatically starts thinking about things like, like, you know, character, uh, what does the character want? What is their unexpressed need? Like just, he doesn't have to sit down and, and come up with a whole backstory for this character. He just knows those are things characters need, right? Like when I start a story, my character needs to, even if they're thirsty, they want something. And then same thing with, with world building. I need to make my world make sense. Um, it needs to be interesting. It needs to be a, an expression of character or push on the character in some way so that it's, it's acting against whatever it is the character wants. That's the situation. And then, um, you know, outcome. Like as you start thinking about these, these things that create stories, it becomes that much easier to sit down and just kind of knock out a story. And, you know, for me, I guess the way I got there, I've, I've always been pretty good at coming up with the characters. I love world building. I have a hard time with plots. And so what I did was, honestly, I just, I just studied. I've got a bunch of books on plotting, um, how to create plots that work. I think I've got one called Seven Master Plots. Story Grid is a really great tool for putting plots together and understanding how character works within plot. And so really getting down to those essentials so that it's kind of like riding a bike. Like you have studied this enough. And I think not only once, because once you, you also start to study things that make stories work, things, the ways that plots work and the way characters work within stories, if you're in a writing group, as you're reading other people's work and critiquing it, that's helping you figure out, figure out how to put the pieces of a story together. Same thing with when you watch movies or read books, like you're just going to start doing it automatically. But understanding those fundamentals frees you up to be able to create more work. And the more you do it, the easier it's going to get. So that might be something that really feels like an obstacle right now. And I think that's part of why those writers that have been working on one manuscript for a long period of time or think they're waiting for inspiration to strike so they can create more more work might be missing or just haven't experienced yet that once you have the fundamentals and it becomes a joy to sit down and just create a new story um it's it kind of frees you to do all these different things so so that might be something to focus on if you have not done that yet or if you feel like you know if it really does feel like sitting down to write a story is a grind well what about it is creating that what's making it difficult you know think about the thing that you really enjoy maybe it's the characters maybe it's the world building you know, what's the piece that's missing and and get that locked down so that it just becomes easier, it becomes like using your favorite tool. It's like playing an instrument. That's really how I think of writing quite often is, is like playing an instrument. You know, yeah, when I first started playing saxophone, it was very difficult to play scales. Um, same thing with guitar. But the more I do it, the better I get. And before long, uh, the fact that I can never play a blues scale is kind of is gone, you know, and I'm moving on to these more complicated um rhythms and scales and things like that. And, and I think writing is very much the same way. Another thing I would recommend, if you're not tracking your writing and know how much you can produce in a given period of time, that for me was one of the most freeing aspects of realizing just how much work I could produce if I was producing consistently. You know, if I'm consistently writing a thousand words a day, it's pretty easy for me to write 30,000 words in a month, you know? And then if I add in some sprint days, where I do 5,000 words, um, I can do even more. So having a really good idea of what you're capable of, it's kind of like you know running, knowing how fast and how far you can run. And if you have never done that before, a great book to get you started is um, 2K to 10K by Rachel Aaron, uh, spelled the same as the way I spell my name, or 5,000 Words an Hour, by Chris Fox. Uh, they both basically break down writing in a very systematic way so that if you're not used to approaching it in an organized manner, those books will help you do that. And I think that's a that's a big part of knowing what you can produce is looking at it in a systematic way. You know, and if you think about what job don't you approach in an organized way if you want to produce actual results, well, writing is the same way. We just don't ever we don't often think of it that way. Um, so as these opportunities come your way and you're confident in your ability to uh, basically create more work, 
um, you know, more work for yourself. Um, now you run into the problem of how do you choose to say, um, how do you choose what to follow and what not to follow? Because you kind of reach a point where, especially if you have a certain level of success, certain level of readers, now you have to be strategic about what, what you're saying yes to. And a lot of it comes down to time. How much time do you have? Um, and then what is, what is your ultimate goal? So if your ultimate goal, like say you started out in fantasy and you want to branch into urban fantasy or romance, well, there are definitely opportunities out there to work with other writers in those genres to try something different. And one of the things I learned early on when I was saying yes to a lot of things is that readers get confused by a Amazon list or a, you know, basically an author list that doesn't kind of tell a story about what that author is selling at least in, in genre fiction, for most genre fiction. Like they're not, they're not following the author, they're following the type of story that they wanna read. So having a lot of kind of strange or one-off things in your uh, catalog can confuse people. So something to think about if you're going to take a project that's different than what you normally write is to use a pen name. And so that can be um, a, great a great kind of freeing exercise to do something totally different and as far as anyone else knows, they'll never know that you wrote it. Um, so, so that can be something to think about. But I think thinking about what your ultimate goal is, you know, so if, if you're a new writer and you're trying to build relationships and, you know, get people just to know you, um, saying yes to projects can be really valuable in that. So you might choose a project that is being put together by a writer that you admire or you know that a writer you admire or would like to work with is in that anthology. Um, so that would be something to look at. The other would be, say you want to branch out into a, dif a different genre. That would be working with writers that are writing in that genre. Um, but being strategic about how you're making those choices to get to that ultimate goal. And I think as long as you have that ultimate goal in mind, maybe it's to make X dollars or to make X relationships or to write X things like, I want to write more short stories or I want to write a novella or my goal is to push myself to write a novel every 90 days, you know, something like that. I think that different projects can help you with that. And those anthologies I was, I was talking about on, um, you know, that are popping up on Amazon are a great way to do that. And I think, so how do I find those anthologies? Well, author groups on Facebook are kind of the best way that I know of to, to find them right now. But then also um, author, yeah, I said author groups, author fan groups for authors you admire. And then interacting in author groups and building relationships with authors is um, another really good way to do that. If you can join, if you're eligible to join the Science Fiction Writers of America, they talk about them as well. Um, and it's really interesting how things pop up. You know, one really popular uh, sort of marketing collection of books is the story bundle. And so recently um, a writer was putting together a space opera story bundle and they just, they posted in a Facebook group. And I really wish that I had something that was eligible. All of my work is in Kindle Unlimited right now and you couldn't be on, in Kindle Unlimited, but boom, there it was opportunity. And so um, being in a position to say yes to that is something that I, I really try to do. So, so what if, um, you know, what if you don't have time to produce more like longer works or things like that? Well, one of the things about short, about the anthologies, um, one thing that can be difficult, I guess, is that Kindle Unlimited really encourages longer work, but they typically, you know, will run like 3000 words up to, you know, 10,000 words or something. And so you can always aim for the lower end of the, uh, whatever the anthology is asking for. So, and that can actually be like a better strategy when it comes to trying to get into an anthology, because if an editor has to make a choice between, you know, one writer with a 10,000 word story or two writers with six, with 3000 word stories, or even three writers, they might do that. You know, you can always get that, uh, that shorter story in, you know, obviously digital Kindle limited doesn't have the same constraints that print does, but, there is a bit of fatigue if you're doing an anthology that has like, you know, 20 writers um, included in, in the anthology. Like it starts to lose focus depending on what, you know, what the goal of the anthology is. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be novels to do, to try new things like this. It can be, um, 
like I said, short stories and whatnot. Something that I expect to come around again, which feels like it's kind of fallen in popularity, is box set opportunities. And so if you're not familiar, a box set on Amazon is typically when an author would organize a bunch of novels together that they would then sell for two, you know, 99 cents or 2.99 on Amazon, like typically all in the same genre, um, a collection of writers. And sometimes these were with the goal of getting on like a list, like the USA Today list, um, not so much the New York Times, although people had done that in the past, but that's not uh, really effective anymore. But um, box sets sometimes will have a buy-in. And I've done this once and I had a, a good experience. It was 60 bucks to buy into the box set. Um, and I made like 150 bucks. So I did, my goal with that was relationships. I wanted to get to know the people that were organizing the box set. Um, it was also in a very different genre than I'd ever written before. And it was a short term deal. So it wasn't like I was going to be in that box set and then it would be on my Amazon catalog for the rest of my career. It was there for a short period of time. I got the experience of trying to write a story in a different genre, got different some different readers, and, and then it was done. And that was it. And I got paid. So um, those are definitely out there. I think you want to be careful when you start getting into really high buy-ins. I've seen them for, you know, especially in romance where depending on who it is, they, they can promise a lot of money, but they'll have a buy-in of like $1,500 or five grand, you know, some crazy amount because they're going to do this really big marketing push that, uh, you know, a book normally wouldn't be able to do on its own. And I think for that kind of thing, you definitely really want to research who you're working with. They need to be really transparent. Um, they really need to be willing to talk about the particulars. And now there are also a bunch of tools that didn't exist even a year ago to help split royalties among authors, things like Bundle Rabbit and I believe it's Drafted Digital now is offering tools so you can split royalties. There are plenty of horror stories where people bought into a box set and then the box set did really well, but the person who was collecting those royalties never paid them out and then disappeared. So um, again, that's a situation where you want to be able to say yes to things like that, but really you know, keep your spidey sense on about is this, you know, do I trust this or not? Because I think with, any, with anything where you're trying out something new, you basically have to be willing to let it go. You know, and that's that's the thing about we're able to create products that don't really cost us anything except time. So if you can write a 3000 word short story in, you know, a day or two days, it doesn't cost you anything if it disappears. And then here's the thing about a short story with kind of today's market is even if you submitted that to to an anthology and it doesn't get accepted, which, you know, it's entirely possible that could happen. If you have a newsletter, a website things like that, you can still reuse that uh, in another marketing capacity. So it's not it's not like it used to be where you've got a cycle of stories that you're just rotating through magazines trying to get someone to pick it up until even, you know, most of the non-paying markets don't want your story and it just goes back into your, you know, your hard drive. Um, you can send that work straight out to readers if that's the best thing for it. So you haven't lost anything. Um, so, so having that mentality that I can always create more makes it so it doesn't cost you anything if, you know, you, you produce something and it, and it doesn't take off. Because the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, we, writers, I think, don't want to think about their work as products. But think about the last time you went to the grocery store and you noticed there was a table where someone was doing a tasting, right? And they ask you, do you want to, you want to try this new, this new beer or whatever? And so you'll say, oh, well, what kind of beer is it? Oh, it's a, it's a dark beer. Oh, well, I don't like dark beers. Um, and that could be the end of that interaction. But it's always about having more options. And so as a writer, if you are, you know, creating as much work as you can, not getting too tied up and being a perfectionist or working on the same thing for too long, well, then it allows you to create options for your reader. So if they didn't like this thing, you can offer them these other things, you know, Oh, you don't like military sci-fi for me? So how about space opera? Or this is pretty much space adventure over here. You know, or you don't like series? Well, here's a standalone that I wrote. And so you have a lot of different things to offer people. But that's all because I've been, I've just been trying to produce new work. Um, 
and 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 not focus on that scarcity mentality. And sometimes I think if you're in a writing group where folks have been maybe bringing the same novel over and over again, they're really caught in that scarcity mentality where you know they have to make this thing perfect and they're not going to submit until it's as perfect as the writing group makes it. And then it's going to be, you know, submitting it to agents and so they're putting gates in front of themselves all along the way, which becomes sort of a an excuse not to create more work, you know, and, and once you start creating a lot of work, you kind of see how, I don't want to say how easy it is, but how, how much you can do. I think sometimes you just don't realize like how much you, you actually can do. So yeah, I think uh, as a professional, you should always try and push yourself, you know, try new things. You want to grow as a writer and saying yes is your opportunity to grow. But because you're a professional, you're focused on a professional goal and and that um, that's where the networking, the saying yes to opportunities, the trying new things will will help you grow. And I've seen, you know, I'm, I'm watching this in real time right now, just help a bunch of people. I see these stories all over the place on Facebook where somebody tried new, some new thing, they tried a collaboration, they tried a different genre, and all of a sudden, you know, that's finally the thing that clicks and takes off for them. Uh, one thing I want to mention, though, if you do do if you do try something different, the cool thing about the ebook market is that if you don't want that ebook to exist anymore, like say on Amazon or somewhere else, you can take it down and it disappears. It's like it didn't exist. You can unpublish it, but if you put it in print, it never goes away. <laughs> so so think about that, because once the book is in print on Amazon, at least, which is the largest market, um, now resellers get hold of it. Uh, there are people who just automatically will like copy listings of print books and, you know, resell for different prices. So if it's something that you're not quite sure about, or you maybe don't want it on your catalog, you know, you didn't do it as a pen name, just remember, don't do it in print. Don't make it a print product. And think about that as well. If you're submitting to an anthology where, um, if the anthology is going to keep the print edition up forever, or they keep print rights, then, um, you don't want to, uh, you may not want to submit to that. Same thing with if you're submitting to anthologies, I would say most people are pretty savvy about how, you know, writers keep their rights. And once the exclusionary period is done for Kindle Unlimited, then all rights revert back to the individual authors. But make sure you're checking those contracts, especially if it's going to go on audio. Because remember, remember, if it goes into Audible, it's potentially going to be up there for seven years, you know, because the contract with, with audio, with Audible is a seven year contract. So... So keep that in mind. And again, if it's the kind of thing where I wrote this story because I wanted to submit it to this specific anthology, if it gets in, great, it belongs to that. If it didn't get in, I will use it for something else. So it doesn't hurt me if it's tied up for seven years, right? <laughs> so, okay, so you have any questions about abundance, um, feel free to hit me up. And I am going to move to thinking about this material for a thousand word essay that would potentially go in a newsletter. So <laughs> that's my pushing myself into, uh, into abundance mentality. Okay. Goals for next week. Um, get that essay written on Saturday. Uh, and then basically just put this, put this novel to bed because, uh, we have a pre-order of May 15th, so it's got to be handed, handed off because it needs to get to an editor. Um, I do feel like I've put a lot more by reading through the print. I'm finding just a lot more typos and content edits and things that I would not necessarily have seen before. So, I, th I feel like I'm going to be producing a lot cleaner copy than I typically would have, but um, it still it's got to go. So I'll be getting it. I'll be getting it done this weekend. Um, if you like this podcast, please forward it to uh, a new or old science fiction writer you know. Uh, if you got questions, just uh, shoot me an email at james at jamesaron.net. Until next week, thanks for listening. I'll talk to you later.